Hey friends, thank you so much for tuning in this week for The Spring Online. My name is Matt. I'm the lead pastor here at The Spring, and I can't wait to share today's message with you. This is going to be part 16 of our series through the Book of Romans. We're getting really close to the end. So let's pray. We're going to dive right in. Father, thanks for today. Thanks for my friends that have joined us online this week. I pray, Holy Spirit, as we look into your word that you would speak to us. I pray in these moments, God, that this wouldn't just be information, but instead there would be transformation that comes to us. I pray, God, let the meditation of my heart and the words of my mouth be pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, today, if I had to give a subtitle to our talk today, I would say that it's grace unites us and sustains us. But I really actually would probably prefer to call it your issue may only be your issue. Your issue may only be your issue. See, Paul wrote the book of Romans as a way to unite the church in Rome. They were divided by class and by their cultures. We've got Roman Christians and we've got Jewish Christians. And coming together, there's this cultural clash and Paul's trying to unite them. And he does so by reminding them of what makes them Christians in the first place, the grace of Jesus, that God forgives humans of their sins through the death and resurrection of Jesus Our sin dies with Jesus on the cross and we rise in new life with him. And so Paul's reminding them of that simple truth. And in so doing, he's trying to help them understand what it is to live in unity. He spent the bulk of the book explaining the grace of God to them. And then in these remaining chapters of Romans, these latter portions of the text, he starts to give us instructions and he starts to talk specifically about how to live in harmony with one another. You see, If you're a Christian, then you and I today, we hold one thing in common, and it's the grace that we receive from Jesus. And that's huge, because the thing about being a Christian is it means you're a part of this massive family that spans thousands of years of history, and every continent of the globe has been touched by people that follow Jesus. It's amazing to me to consider how truly large the family of God is. I think today I've I've got... I've got friends in, in Turkey. I've got friends in, 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 in Africa. I've got friends in the UK. I've got friends all over the world that are following Jesus. And I'm so thankful for that. But we're more than friends. We're bound together in this one commonality, the grace of Jesus. And the reason that matters is because it's no small thing. It's actually the most important thing in anyone's life. The grace that we receive from Jesus is actually the most important thing that any one of us will ever experience. And it's that uniting factor that pulls us together. But wow, do we have a ton of opinions about how to be the church, right? Like, like we've, we've got all kinds of opinions about how to be the church, what the church should look like. You know, there have been times in the history of the church when people have divided over the temperature of the baptismal water. Uh, there are people that, that divide over the specific ways in which we do communion. They, they divide over all kinds of stuff, We put so many little barriers into our own unity, into our own harmony, that it's important for us to come back to the thing that matters most, what Jesus has done for us, his grace. We have all these opinions about how to be the church. We have all these opinions about what it means to be human. We're living through challenging times where everybody broadcasts their exact thoughts at any given moment, informed or not. We broadcast our thoughts and our opinions, and we throw those things out into the wild and hope that somewhere on the internet, someone agrees with us or more people agree with us than don't agree with us. But I think also there's a small part of us that wants somebody to argue with us online because we want the opportunity to prove our point, to prove that we're right. Listen, in a world that is incredibly divisive, the church of Jesus, the people that follow Jesus, Christians are supposed to join together. We're supposed to live in harmony. We're supposed to be people that love one another. The church is supposed to get along with itself. So I have a simple question that we need to answer today. How do we remain in harmonious, holy community when we approach so many issues from so many angles? I mean, if we've got so so many opinions, like if we have as many opinions in any given church as there are seats in that church, then how do we remain in a harmonious, holy community with each other? What is it we need to do? Well, I think if there's one thought that I want you to remember from today's message, it's simply this. It's that following Jesus means dealing with my sin and not everyone else's. Following Jesus means dealing with my sin 
and not everyone else's. That is such an easy temptation to fall into, isn't it? To begin to think that the way that God is convicting me and the way that God is working in my life is exactly what I should project onto the rest of the world, especially people that don't even follow Jesus, people that don't uh, uh, claim to be Christians. It's amazing how quickly Christians will expect the world that is not Christian to behave like Christians. And then they'll look at other Christians and say, well, you don't Christian the way that I Christian. So clearly the way that you Christian is the wrong way to Christian. There's a serious problem with that. If we're going to follow Jesus, it means I have to deal with my sin and not everyone else's. See, we will be quick to point to the sliver in the eye of someone on the other side of the world before we'd be willing to address the log that's in our own eye. It's like Jesus said, right? He said, you know, we'll, we'll pick at the speck in our neighbor's eye, the sliver in their eye, when there's a great big log, a plank of wood hanging out of our own eye. We should deal with the plank first, and then maybe we can help our friend with the sliver. The point is this, we have to be willing to look at our sin and address that and allow the love and holiness of Jesus to come through our lives instead of trying to point the finger everywhere else. It's a lot easier to look externally than it is to look internally. But here's the thing. We've received grace. Therefore, we must be gracious. You cannot receive grace and then not be gracious. It's, it's the ultimate hypocrisy. Listen, people are hypocrites about everything. And I understand this. And I agree. I'm a hypocrite. You're a hypocrite. We're all hypocrites on some level or another. But as much as it's within our power, we should at least try to close this gap between our philosophy and our practice, right? And, and we should try to make that gap a little narrower. And in this respect, we're able to do it because we've received the grace of Jesus. We should then in turn be able to give grace to other people. We should be able to give grace to people that are different than us. We should be able to give grace to people that disagree with us. We should be able to give grace because we've received such great grace. In Romans, our text today really is the entirety of Romans chapter 14 and, and the first 13 verses of Romans chapter 15. But rather than read the whole thing today, I just want to go through and hit some of the uh, thesis statements through this passage. I would encourage you to go read the whole thing yourself, but this is going to be kind of us jumping through the text a little bit just for the sake of time. So here we go. This is Romans chapter 14, verse 1. Paul tells the Christians in Rome, he says this, accept other believers who are weak in faith and don't argue with them about what they think is right or wrong. Accept other believers who are weak in faith and don't argue with them about what they think is right or wrong. As a pastor, let me just tell you, one of the grand frustrations of the ministry is that you get all sorts of people that will come to you and say, well, you know, this person, they have this one little idea in their theology wrong. At least I think it's wrong. And so you need to go deal with it, pastor. You need to go correct it. No, 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 no. Deal with yourself. Deal with your sin. Let the spirit of God deal with their sin. You see, grace compels us to accept one another. Grace should compel us to accept one another. Instead, what do we do? We want to nitpick each other so that we feel better about ourselves. The simple truth is all of humanity is mired in sin. We are all marked by it. And thanks be to God that through Jesus, we receive grace. So as we receive grace, let's give grace. Grace should compel us to accept one another instead of picking little fights, saying, oh, well, that person just isn't a very strong Christian. Someone needs to go help them Christian better. Now, let's skip forward in the text. This is Romans chapter 14, verses 10 through 13. Paul writes these words. He says, so why do you condemn another believer? Why do you look down on another believer? Remember, we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. Just let that sink in for a moment. We will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For the scriptures say, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bend to me and every tongue will declare allegiance to God. So Paul continues, he says, yes, each of us will give a personal account to God. Not an account of what the pastor did, not an account of what the other people in the church did, not an account of what your neighbor across the street did, not an account of what the people in your house did. You will give a personal account to God. So let's stop condemning each other. This is Paul. 
Let's stop condemning each other. Instead, decide to live in such a way that you'll not cause another believer to stumble and fall. As Christians, we bear a responsibility to one another, and it's not to point out each other's imperfections. Instead, it's to not allow my imperfections to cause you an issue. I have to deal with my stuff so that you can deal with your stuff. You see, you will only give an account to God of your own actions. So take your eyes off of each other and place them on Jesus. This is so often the problem. We want to look at all the big stuff going on in the world. We want to look at the president, and we want to look at the 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 Senate and the Congress and the uh, the 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 Supreme Court of the United States. We want to look at all these people, the governor, the mayor, like whatever. You want to look at all these people, the people who live on your street. You want to look at all these other people instead of looking at Jesus. Listen, we need to look to Jesus. He's poured out grace for us so that we can be gracious. You will only give an account to God for your actions, no one else's. So perhaps stop trying to take responsibility for everybody else and take responsibility for yourself. Paul continues, this is Romans 14, verse 19. He says this, then let us aim for harmony in the church and try to build each other up. Let us aim for harmony in the church and try to build each other up. Let me point something out here. When, when I was young coming up in church, I would hear all these verses in the Bible about the importance of unity and harmony. And, and pastors would rightly say things like the real power and life of the church is in our unity. It's in our harmony. It's in those things. And it always drove me a bit batty because I always thought it sounded a little like flowery, right? It, it, but now after 20 some years in the ministry and, and, and four years as a lead pastor, I have become convinced of one thing, the most important thing that marks the life of, uh, of a church, the most important thing that marks the health of a church is whether or not they can live in harmony with each other. Harmony matters. Harmony doesn't mean we're all exactly the same. It just means that we're all going the same direction. You see, harmony in the church takes all of us working together. You can't just have the leaders creating harmony. It takes everyone in the church committing to it. That means that when we have conflict with one another, we get it out in the open and we deal with it right away. That means that that when I'm struggling, I'm honest with my struggle and I'm honest with those around me about my struggle instead of trying to appear holier than I am. Instead of trying to impress somebody, I have to be honest. You see, harmony takes all of the members of the church working together. And it's the grace of Jesus that unites us. And it's the grace that we extend to each other that sustains us. Jesus' grace unites us. We come together as a people. We become Christians because of the grace of Jesus. And then our extending grace to one another is the thing that sustains us. It's the thing that helps us to be the church. You want to be a healthy church? You want to be a healthy Christian? Extend grace. Stop being quick to judge. Stop being quick to criticize. And instead, celebrate what God is doing. Look at yourself for correction and celebrate what God is doing in those around you. A bit more of the text. This is Romans chapter 14, verses 20 through 23. Listen to what Paul says. Don't tear apart the work of God over what you eat. One of the big problems, of course, they were having in Rome is you've got Jewish Christians who have lived their entire lives as Jewish people practicing the Jewish law, the Mosaic law around their diet, things that they eat. And then you get these Roman Christians who don't have any dietary restrictions that they've grown up with and instead just eat whatever. We eat kosher. We don't care what we eat. And part of the challenge for them is in the first century, the church gathered around a meal for worship. And the sacred act of gathering around a meal for worship was becoming a point of conflict because this group of Christians grew up feeling offended by eating certain kinds of things they thought were unclean. And then this group of Christians said they shouldn't care instead of saying, I care more about them than what I eat. We need to care more about each other than what we eat. And, and, and that's a great metaphor for so many things in the church, isn't it? So listen to what Paul says, Romans 14, 20 through 23. Don't tear apart the work of God over what you eat. Remember, all foods are acceptable, but it is wrong to eat something if it makes another person 
stumble. It is better not to eat meat or to drink wine or do anything else if it might cause another believer to stumble. You may believe that there's nothing wrong with what you're doing, but keep it between yourself and God. Keep it between yourself and God. Blessed are those who don't feel guilty for doing something that they have decided is right. But if you have doubts about whether or not you should eat something, you're sinning if you go ahead and do it. For if you're not following your convictions, you're not following your convictions. If you do anything that you believe is not right, you are sinning. First of all, causing division and strife, according to Paul, is tearing apart the work of God. Listen to how violent that is. It's like, it's like demolishing the building. It's like ripping apart the relationship. It's, it's this tearing apart of the unity of the church. So don't tear apart the work of God over trivial things. Don't do it. Don't get caught up in that. And then further, understand the role of conviction, the Holy Spirit directing each believer into holiness. It's his job. It's what he does. And as he directs each of us into holiness, it's important for us to recognize that he's going to direct each of us uniquely because we're unique and we have unique experiences and we have unique struggles. And we have unique sin profiles. And so what does the spirit of God do? He uniquely convicts us. We must live in response to our own convictions, trusting that the Holy Spirit can convict each of us, perfecting each of us in his own time. And that, I think, is the challenge for Christians a lot of time. We look around the room and we expect, you know, that person should be doing way better with this thing that I mastered a long time ago, when really... Really, what we should be dealing with is responding to the Holy Spirit saying, why are you judging a brother? Why are you judging your sister? Get it together, church. Let's jump forward again. This is Romans chapter 15, verses five through seven. Paul says this, may God who gives this patience and encouragement help you live in complete harmony with each other as is fitting for followers of Christ Jesus. Then all of you, can join together with one voice, giving praise and glory to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And listen to what he says. He says, therefore, accept each other just as Christ has accepted you so that God will be given glory. Jesus accepted you. And because he accepted you, you are now expected to accept the rest of the church. I don't like that kind of person. I don't understand that kind of person. I think that person smells. I think they're kind of weird. Accept the members of the church. Live in harmony together because that's the call. You see, if you struggle to accept a person in the church, just think of how wretched you were when Christ first accepted you. If you're having trouble accepting someone in the church because you're looking at them and thinking, they just need to get their act together. Well, think of how sinful you were when you first came to Jesus. And think of, of, of the, the revelation of your own sin when you first came to Jesus and allow that to be the guide that leads you into grace and compassion for somebody else. Because if you're feeling judgmental towards them, perhaps you've forgotten how much you've been forgiven of. Remember, the world will know that we belong to Jesus by the way that we love each other. Let me say that again. The world will know that Christians belong to Jesus by the way that we love each other. Not the way we love the world, not the way we do things, the way we love each other. Jesus himself said that. He said that the world would know that we belong to him by the way that we love one another. It's the way we love each other. It's not through our great services, though we should have great services. And it's not through our great programs, though we could have great programs. It's, it's not through our great outreaches, though we could have great outreaches. And it's not through our piety that the world will know that we belong to Jesus. No, the world will, belong, will know that Christians belong to Jesus by the way that Christians love one another. The primary witness to the world that Jesus is at work in a church is the way that we love each other. Listen, so often we want to nitpick each other because we're concerned about holiness. If we aim for harmony, we will find holiness along the way. If we aim for harmony, we will find holiness along the way. 
you aim to live in harmony with other Christians, then you will find holiness along the way. You learn what it is to lovingly accept and give grace to one another. Trust me, holiness will be a product in your life. What's interesting is that in this passage, Paul is, is writing, and it's, it's around the year 57 AD. But what he's talking about is something that the church elders had tried to address much earlier. See, in, in AD 48 to 50, somewhere in there, the Jerusalem council took place. And at that Jerusalem council, the apostles determined the standards that should be placed upon Gentile Christians, non-Jewish Christians, standards that should be placed upon them. Because there was a great deal of controversy over whether or not the Gentile Christians should be required to follow all the laws of Moses. So I want you to understand something. We come up with a lot of ideas and reasons and, 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 and standards and rules and have our own opinions about what a Christian should look like and what a church should be. So let's look at the apostles and let's ask them what they said the standard should be for Christians. In fact, let's go to Acts chapter 15, verses 28 through 29. This is the letter that the apostles send out to be delivered by the apostle Paul to Gentile believers everywhere to help them understand what is required of them as they're going to follow Jesus. This is the entirety of the letter. This is Romans 15, 28 through 29 minus the greeting, it says this, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay no greater burden on you than these few requirements. You must abstain from eating food offered to idols. You must abstain from consuming blood or the meat of strangled animals. And you must abstain from sexual immorality. If you do this, you will do well. Farewell. We come up with so many standards and so many ideas about what it is to be a Christian and all that Paul and the apostles tell the rest of the Gentile world at that time is simply this, to stop eating food offered to idols, so stop participating in the worship of false gods. Stop consuming blood or the meat of strangled animals. Don't eat things that are unclean because it'll be an offense to your brothers and sisters, right? So, so one is an issue of our worship the second is an issue of the way we interact with one another. And the third, abstain from sexual immorality, is an issue of our personal holiness. If you do these three things, you'll do well. These prohibitions are put in place to remove a practice of idolatry, to bring peace between two differing cultural views, and to guide the Gentiles away from overt acts of sin that would ultimately divide the churches. What's the point? Why is Matt pointing all of this out to you today? Really simple. Following Jesus is far less complicated than we make it if we would just allow the Holy Spirit to deal with ourselves. If I'll just let the Holy Spirit deal with me and you'll just let the Holy Spirit deal with you, then we will find our way into holiness together. You see, following Jesus means dealing with my sin and not everybody else's. Are we able to look at the world and say, you know what, the way the world is doing this, uh, it, it doesn't line up with the word of God? Certainly. But I think more important than looking at the rest of the world is allowing the word of God to shape our own lives first. That's where we have to start. And maybe today that's the starting point for you. Today, perhaps you need to start by surrendering your life to God. So stop trying to do it all on your own to allow the Holy Spirit to deal with your sin first. We like to say that coming to Jesus is as easy as A, B, C. A, you've got to admit that you're a sinner. B, you've got to believe that he is the savior for sinners and the only one. And C, you've got to choose to follow him. Admit you're a sinner, believe he's a savior, and choose to follow him. If you want to do that, pray a simple prayer with me right now, right where you're at. One sentence, just pray it out loud, just like this. Jesus, I give you my life. Amen. Listen, if you prayed that prayer for the first time, I want to encourage you. If you're here in Coachella Valley, come join us on a Sunday at the spring. You'll find all the details about our services at our church website, thespring.church. That's all you got to do. If you're not in Coachella Valley, find a great Bible teaching church in your community and be a part because the only way to grow in holiness and the grace of Jesus is to learn to share the grace of Jesus with one another. Because following Jesus means dealing with my own sin and not everyone else's. So I'm going to let him deal with me so that I can live in harmony with everybody else. 
Hey, thanks for tuning in again today. Make sure you like, comment, subscribe, share, do all the stuff so that you get this content every week and others can be blessed by it too. We'll see you next time.